where we are looking at the transformative power of education from the perspective of women leaders who are really on the forefront of addressing these challenges across all <laughs> continents. We could possibly have a better panel uh, than this to do so because we are not simply um, sharing our perspectives and our visions for the future of education from an academic perspective, from a, uh, um, a perspective of you know, what we would like to see, but really every one of the women leaders on this panel is going to share from her direct experience in their respective context, how have they faced the challenges and actually how they are <laughs> making this vision come, come true already in what they do. Is I will first start, I'll turn the floor to Pilar Alvarez Lasso, who has been working since 2010 with, the, with UNESCO, building on a very distinguished career as one of the, you know, a media figure, a political journalist at the forefront in Mexico, um, and then was invited to be the Assistant Director General for Humanities and Social Sciences, if I got that right, at, um, at UNESCO, and then served as a head of mission in several countries, including most recently Haiti, before that many years in Costa Rica, and also in, Uzbek in Uzbekistan. Uh, Pilar, you'll be giving us a bit of a global perspective of your vision for the future of education briefly. And then we would turn to hear our three women panelists who are already here uh, from three very different contexts, focusing on very different issues, but each time with this very holistic, transformative, humanizing and um, pioneering approach or paradigm shifting approach, I should really say, we will go uh, from Pilar, we will zoom into India, where I happen to find myself, unfortunately, a bit too far to be sitting side by side with Sujatha, but we will go to Dr. Sujatha Kandekar, who will tell us about the remarkable experience she's had over the last decades, three, uh, more than three decades, with the women in what are called the slums, but really the grassroots women in uh, Mumbai and across, she'll explain, the many regions they work on and how they are now based on that experience creating a grassroots leadership academy. Uh, she will explain more about that. From there, we will zoom to Jerusalem, to East Jerusalem, where we will meet Zahira Kamal, one of the, the, the women's leaders of that country who has been the first um, Minister of Women's Affairs in Palestine and had a revolutionary approach to how she set up that ministry, but has also been the first woman to be the Secretary General of a political party, the FIDA party, and has been an activist for peace and, um, and freedom all of her life, as well as a women's leader and an educator, a physics teacher uh, with UNRWA to start with. And then we zoom over to Brazil, to Thais Corral, in Sinal, so that we bring in the environmental perspective. And Thais, who's been a leader of the women and environment movement, was leading the Women's Caucus already in Rio in 1992, and has led many uh, different environmental and women's movements in um, Brazil. And over the last uh, decade, has set up a revolutionary um, program called Sinal with youth and business leaders, which she will tell us about. So we will hear from them, turn back to Pilar to share how does this resonate with your experience, both from Mexico, but around the world and a, a UNESCO perspective. And we hope we will be able to get a few perspectives also from others who join us um, on this session. Further ado, I'm going to hand over to you, dear Pilar, to get us started. Thank you, dear Rama. Thank you for this initiative. I'm privileged to be here with these distinguished personalities, with Sahira. Nice to see you again, Sahira. Thais, Suhata, hopefully Munira, and Chopin. Thank you for, for the support. Thank you really for this invitation in participating in this fifth international conference on future education. And what it is special is that this is a collaborative thought space that is being convened by the World Academy of Art and Science and the World Consortium for Universities. Thank you, do not stop there. Also, I think that the CADMUS journal paper 
a new paradigm in higher education for sustainable development and human security. It's a thought piece that inspires to, to think ahead, to think with anticipation on what education lays ahead of us. And uh, looking into futures, um, as former uh, assistant director general for UNESCO, regardless of what the program says, I, I, was, I am a former ADG. Um, I'd like to bring to the table this new social contract for education that UNESCO has put forward to member states and that has just been adopted. And I will be very brief, uh, pointing to some points that um, are, I think, very relevant for the discussion. I've been listening to some of the, well, to the opening, of course, greetings to my dear former boss, Irina Bokova, um, and also to some of other of the debates. So many of the things have already been told in, in this international conference. And I will focus maybe with the, the provisions of being focused on, and maybe partial, on things that I have noted that would be very important for, for my own reflection. And if somebody else is also feeling that this resonates, it would be absolutely fantastic. And I'm going to start by sharing what I just saw that should be reminded or maybe framed for our conversation. Education is no longer what has been in the last centuries. Now we are facing completely a, a paradigm that is in the making. Where, when, what, how, why, all the five W's of any journalist that are also relevant in research will now are relevant to think about the sustainability of education and how education looks in the future. And UNESCO called a new social contract for, for UNESCO, a, a new social contract for education. And it explains that constructing a new social contract means exploring new ways of thinking about education, knowledge and learning. These are three parts are very important. Education, knowledge, and learning. Our difficulties are not only the result of limited resources and means. Our challenges also stem from why and how we educate and we find ways to organize learning. Very briefly, this new social contract for education is anchored in two foundational principles the right to education and a commitment to education as a public society endeavor and a common good. This right of education must be expanded to include the right to quality education throughout life. This is very important because when the Universal Declaration of Human Rights was passed, and I am speaking here to people that are very familiar and knowledgeable on it, that say very clearly say that the, the right to education did not have or was not framed as, as precise as it is now to include the right to quality education and throughout life. So lifelong learning becomes an, a something that to be discussed in this panel and of course has been in the in the conference now what is throughout life long long life le learning it is in, it has been interpreted before that the right to education only as the right to schooling for children and youth almost vastly not only now going forward the right to education must assure education of all ages in all areas of life because we are all familiar, key disruptions and emerging transformations are spreading change in areas that are overlapping. And here again, I cite the 
UNESCO report on futures of education or the new social contract for education. These four overlapping areas are environmental change, Thais is going to also speak on it, technological acceleration, governance, and social fragmentation, that on one side, and new worlds of work. So coming from this perspective of education as a common good, we come to something that is very familiar in the international sciences, international relations, which is interdependence. Again, that zoom in is now that interdependence is not only about states, it is also about nations, therefore it is also about individuals, it is about communities. That is the way that education can, will continue, has been, uh, especially in the 19th and 20th century, we are now challenging, all to, challenging it all together. Education has been the way we organize teaching and learning throughout life and has found a has played a foundational role in the transformation of human societies. Education, here I cite the report, is education is how we organize the intergenerational cycle of knowledge transmission and co-creation. Yes, of course, also it's about also social transformations, inclusivity. It's about how we see the world and how we believe in the world. So going very quickly with some notes on areas relevant for higher education, which is the, 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 in the context of the conference and of this panel, which is very much um, based on, on women, with women. And, but I would like to bring three areas. Aging, we are in an era of extreme longevity. Before we spoke only about longevity, but now we are speaking about extreme longevity. It has an impact on higher education. The reskilling revolution that Davos also passed this full um, idea of what we will be facing with the new needs for skilling, upskilling, reskilling in order to be able to continue in the formal and many times in the informal work environment. The other important area is digital that is completely paramount on how in, uh, education is going to be rethought, not in this century, in this decade and gender. It's not only about uh, that gender is a cross-cutting area, but it is also how, how it can be, should be, must be relevant in the way we think education. And I will briefly go into these notes. So uh, about aging, education is a vector of growth. Population aging influences economic growth and labor force participation. In 2020, there was an estimated 727 million persons, 727 million persons aged 65 years or over, over, over worldwide. This number is projected to more than double by 2050, reaching over 1.5 five billion persons. That means 16% of world population will be over, over 65 years old. Right now, we are about 10% uh, if we are taking into consideration as well, people over 60, not only 65. So I found this idea of Catherine Petrie, maybe other people have also thought about, of it, but um, I'm taking it, which is a, the minister for the, the idea of creating in the countries, which is not about creating, it is simply the donating idea, a ministry of long life, long life learning. It is incredible to think from the perspective, but again, education has been seen many times and also we look at it because it is, part of, it is the right of education, and it is, of course, that the political, uh, the policies, the social policies in, in, in all countries, that there is uh, a very important part for 
children, for children and for youth and for young adults. But now that time is coming for people, adult, uh, adults age 60 and over, there are some people that even say that uh, recarreering should be as early as 35 or 40 years of old. So it, the, the labor force at the global level is estimated to continue the current upward trend in the coming decades. However, we are facing other phenomena, automation, artificial intelligence. Therefore, we are looking at a new way of including, and I say it uh, with a lot of care, including older adults into education because it is a 10% of the current population is a lot and 16% or 20, even some are saying 22% of the global population will be of people that would be living with a baby boomers might be heading to at least another 30 years of career life. And certainly it is necessary to look at from the perspective of um, how the social contract integrates older people. Living longer means working longer, means opening new opportunities for education. However, at the same time, there is, speaking of new opportunities, there is also age-based discrimination. One of the main barriers faced by older persons in employment and in access to higher education, and not only higher education, but I'm focusing on it, is age-based discrimination. And it manifests itself in the form of individual, institutional, systemic, or structural practices. Inadequate access to lifelong learning systems means that exclusion will continue. Certainly training and access to formal and informal learning to everyone at all phases of life, from early childhood education through adult learning, should encompass access to training opportunities to, for older persons that can hamper their ability to continue working or find new employment. Many skills become obsolete in the rapid changing labor market, and that's true for the youth as well. So the demand for yeah. skilling, reskilling, upskilling grows. Okay, great. I was going to say, because this is a perfect point, actually, the fact that you actually highlighted this issue as the first of your three, uh, if you would be willing to hold the other two points, because I think they could come in very well when you've heard the other speakers. But I think this is a very, very good framing you've given us. So please hold on to the two other points, which are very, very key. But I'm very happy you began with this point, because I think actually what, uh, as we move on to Sujata, she's actually gonna show exactly this about how this, this idea of lifelong learning, this idea of anyone at any point in that life cycle can be a transformative learner, educator with, with collaborative knowledge. So thank you very much, because I really feel in this session, we are beginning to, not beginning, we are continuing to craft together that social contract. <laughs> With this, I move over to you, uh, Sujata, and uh, ask you your experience, your vision and your experiences for the future of education. Thank you so much, Pilar, for starting us off on such a good note. Yeah, thank you, Pilar, and thank you, Rama, and all of the panelists and for this opportunity uh, to share the experience and think together, cool thinking, you know, part of that. And actually, I want to bring in, into this discussion the context uh, of marginalized women that we have been working for the last so many years, the women that are left behind. I mean, actually, these are women uh, who are excluded from the realm of education for centuries. And it is just the societal perception, the powerful in the society thought that they don't have ability to learn, to get educated, neither they need to learn. 
because then they 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 took the reins in their hand of thinking and acting on behalf of these marginalized people that's how this uh, the communities and the women that i'm talking about are excluded from the realm of education and actually the the whole experience initially was situated in the lifelong learning that will just mentioned how so we were working with adult education thing and um, actually i want to bring in story am i um, you know of uh, our work how our understanding of education evolved over the process because we were working for adult education started with the books that were given by government of maharashtra or state government uh, and took these books because we all the um, organizers of this program came from very middle class upper class background and we had our social baggage with them and we thought it's so easy actually tell people to uh, the importance of adult education give them books and then your work is only supervision whether they learn or not whether they come to classes or not but actually the demystification happened because adult education adult literacy was not a felt need of women who were coming to classes they didn't feel that was relevant and in spite of many efforts women didn't come to the classes actually when we were exploring different ways of how we can connect women to the process of adult education to the learning actually we found that uh, there were all women were getting uh, subsidized ration like uh, kerosene grain sugar etc from government uh, licensed shops and there was lot of there were a lot of corrupt practices happening in that realm of public distribution system and women had lot of grievances about that system and then when we did a small survey we could locate that there were 25 grievances or complaints that they wanted to lodge and we also bumped across a rule in the system that if somebody writes a complaint in a complaint book which is 24 hours in the ration shop the officer has to come back to this person saying what action he or she has taken on that complaint you know and nobody knew about this rule i mean people were absolutely ignorant but then we thought actually writing a complaint needs skill to write and also courage to write because all the shop owners were protected by local hooligans gundas mafias etc political party leaders and then so we set aside the kits given by government the literacy learning kits and designed our own kits so simple the first lesson was writing wheat the second lesson was writing sugar the third lesson was writing kerosene and the longer sentences were the wheat is rotten sugar is wet i lost foam uh, kerosene in my foam etc all those 24 uh, he abused me the shop owner abused me so all 24 complaints uh, that women wanted to lodge were made part of comprehensive understanding in the literacy process and i tell you it was like a magic that happened all literacy and we explain what these writings can bring change in women's lives how they can address their issue and actually literacy classes were buzzed with this writing we mobilized women class wise they went in um, groups together started writing complaint in the complaint book which had never ever happened and that had in a way protected the nexus between the shop owners and the government officers and everybody that was associated so the shop owners who were not paying heed to women and were abusing them started coming home to this women and saying i can give you one month advance ration but don't write anything there actually i think this was like an awakening of what words can do and in spite of many efforts that we had done for so long we couldn't connect women with the literacy because it was not relevant to what their needs were the lesson we learned from this you know and actually that gave credibility uh, to the organization i thought women understood why we are doing what we are doing and what we wanted to achieve through literacy and actually coro became really a community participative organization since then and i think what uh, lessons we do from this you know because any intervention education and educational intervention has to be relevant to people's life there are two approaches to education one is banking education what was we doing what we were doing like irrespective of knowing 
what women's needs were. We were just trying to dump information after information on them, which was most often very irrelevant to them. And we never bothered. That was probably our arrogance of like, we know each, everything, like what these women need and what we should give them. So that was the arrogance. And so women responded negatively to that arrogance. And when they saw that the literacy learning is becoming relevant to their life changing, it is really in a way transformative to their lives. They didn't need external motivation. They just did that. And the lesson was also actually people want to change. There is a perception from outside that people in slums, people in low income communities, actually they love inertia. They don't want to change. We realize that it is not that inertia, it is not the unwillingness, but it is helplessness, helplessness stemming out of the powerlessness that makes women uh, to not to speak, not to say anything, not to think the way they want to think. And that builds the false consciousness, that builds the adopted consciousness. All socialization is directed towards building this false consciousness, that you are nothing, you are no worth, kind of, you don't understand anything. That, And if any intervention that tries to deal with, deal with and address this fragmented sense of identity, then the trajectory has no limit. That was our learning. We also learned that it was not enough to give information, but it was. it is important to give application of that information, a vehicle to actualize that information that will bring actual change. And we also learned that there resides power within in every person and every woman that just needs to get triggered, you know, that just needs to get facilitated so that um, they understand and realize what lies within them, what is their latent potential. We mobilize people together for collective action so that they get strength and then they can change their own environment. Based on this realization, then we designed the leadership program, which is called grassroots leadership development program, especially from marginalized community, but also especially for women within marginalized communities. The premises of this program are, are three premises. One is the initiative for change has to come from within, from within an individual and within the marginalized community. Second, solidarity is the biggest asset of marginalized people. Individuals cannot change their near context. They have, there has to be, there have to be collective action. So the whole program has very, uh, is really interwoven with a lot of collective actions. And the third uh, premise is all such leaders need ne supportive nearest ecosystem to thrive. So how do you create that nearest ecosystem? So based on these three things, Actually, we have developed and we are doing this program for the last 12 years, which is a high impact program. I'll just give you an example of the impact of the program. Um, a friend who was to be there on the call today, so um, on our conference today. So she came to uh, this program in 2000 with acute marital violence. Uh, I mean, experience of acute marital violence and she wanted to redress it. She came in the program, realized her potential, started working with other women. And in 2015, she figured in BBC's list of 100 most influential women working on violence against women. I think this is the trajectory. Or another friend who was who attempted suicide twice actually said at the end of the program that I'm now creating safe environment for girls and women in my community. So I think this is the trajectory. And if we see what are the underlying processes, why people see that, why people feel that, why people do that, I think the only answer is it is unlocking of power within. And we've been doing this for the uh, last 12 years with almost identical impact with every batch. But then our understanding of uh, education also evolved after doing this for 12 years. We realized that it's not enough only to work with the marginalized communities for their empowerment, you know? It has to become a social need. People from outside grassroots should really understand the importance and significance of this knowledge, these lived realities, these experiences, and actually their co-thinking needs to happen, you know? So actually we are now working on Academy of Grassroots Leadership, which has two arms. One arm is of course, uh, empowerment, 
bottom up empowerment which we have been doing for the last 12 years and really very impactfully i i think because the impact that people have created in their own areas is incredible but the other arm of that is working take building bridges between different elements of wider ecosystem when i say different elements of wider system it is academia it is media it is other larger ngos and other developments it is donors you know i mean all of them how can we create bridges and actually facilitate the processes that they understand the lived experiences the wisdom uh, the knowledge that lies at the grassroots and how do we integrate this into the way they are thinking and acting in their own areas with their work and actually here comes the question of what we are missing in the education we talked of higher education but i'm talking about the higher is very relative to we all know but even education i'm talking from the section where even education is relative to you know like what do you perceive as education and what is missing is actually how do we look beyond us you know there are two spectrums i just talked about the education that is needed that we tried at the spectrum which is marginalized but the spectrum that is privileged that needs to understand their privileges you know and actually should be willing to share those privileges and i think every one of us is at different points in the journey and understanding why i am at different point in the journey is a very hopeful position to be in and actually the academy is facilitating this uh, process how both ends understand each other and look forward to co-create collaborate thanks i think i would stop here yeah that this is fabulous i mean you've covered so much without even talking about some of the exceptional things like how you brought ceos from the us the uk to come and live and learn from your grassroots women leaders or the way you did your own phd with the co researchers who were the grassroots women leaders who've gone on this trajectory or how many of your these grassroots women leaders have now entered politics and been elected to power etc but this was a super which you put us right on the spot and i think really building on this will be zahira kamal and the exceptional work that she has done together you know this collaborative transformative work in um the the context in Palestine and across the Middle East so we turn to you Zahira and look forward to hearing you thank you so very much Sujatha that was so empowering to hear you thank you something in common uh with each uh, other uh and there are some dif- differences due to the uh, region and the uh, uh, life of uh, women in our uh, in different regions and uh, here i want to say that thinking about the future challenges of education uh, reminds me with a lot of initiatives that women organizations did and still doing it to meet the challenges in this region which insist on that we are learning from different resources not only through schools and the universities and there is no limits for age of education it can continue for all of our lives and i'm honored here to share with you some of the experiences that i have as you know this region had suffered from armed struggle for a long decades and that led to killing of people imprisonment demolition of houses increase of poverty instability and mass immigration of young people women studies center was pioneer in taking responsibility to empower victimized women training programs were initiated exploring their strong points training them to speak out opening new opportunities for them to travel and participate in conferences sharing with other women their experiences such programs support women with tools and skills to stand up again and to be strong to face these challenges and help other women facing it that experience was exchanged with a uh, woman in organizations in Syria and Iraq increase of violence in the family and society 34% of women in Palestine were subjected to one kind or more of violence in the family up to the 19th of the past century that issue was considered as family issue women were shy to talk about it 
they say that dirty laundry should not be hanged in front of the neighbors. Women's Center for Legal Aid and Counseling was established in 1992 to support women to speak out, encourages them to raise their voices, telling them that dirty laundry should be hanged in the sun, otherwise its filthy smell will spread over. Monitoring reports on family violence were used to call for family protecting laws to defend women and children from violence. In addition, women were provided with training programs on raising their awareness and the society about women rights and the impact of violence on society. But the Palestinian government adopted family protection law, which was submitted by women organizations. The law considered the killing of women under what's called honor killing is a crime that should be punished by law. Third, availability and accessibility of education in its various stages. In the beginning of the 70s of the past century, the percentage of literate women did not exceed then 18%. Many of girls were not enrolled in school. To face this crucial problem, a coordination with Birzeit University to initiate the literacy programs and educational curriculums and motivate students through volunteer programs to teach in literacy classes. Women organizations opened literacy classes in villages and encourage illiterate women to join it. These literacy programs help in eradication of illiteracy in Palestine. Illiteracy between women dropped down from 82% in 1978 to almost 2% now. For job creation and unemployment eradication. Unemployment in Palestine is high at 30% with 20% in West Bank and around 60% in Gaza, more than twice of the unemployment rate in the world. 500,000 new jobs are needed to accommodate new young workers. Women are the most suffering of unemployment in Palestine. Women are making 21% of paid manpower unemployment between educated women is higher. Uh, women organizations provided unemployed women with skills and financial needs to start their own businesses through saving and lending programs. Asala for Credit and Development Company, was, which is a woman organization, was the pioneer organization in the region. And uh, prepare women to be productive and accountable and give them loans and skills to be initiative and self-guidance. In order to cope with the rapid progress of technology, the Ministry of Women Affairs started a program called Tawasul. Tawasul means communication. Uh, and this was established in different governance to support women working in different governance on new technology and being able to access information. At the same time, Palestinian Women Committee is, uh, opened mother schools to prepare mothers to cope with these changes and to be able to support and follow up their children's education and to guide them to access information. Six, bridging the gender gap between men and women in society. Ministry of Women Affairs was pioneer in developing guidelines, instructions for gender development, which include gender mainstreaming, gender planning and evaluation, gender education and gender budgeting. Governmental and non-governmental employees were trained to implement these guidelines in their work. Reports were developed to measure the evolution of the status of women and to monitor the policies taken by the government to bridge the gender gap between men and women in the society. Women's Studies Center faculty were trained to be trainers and they still training women and men working in the government, private sector and NGOs on these issues. Seven, playing an active role in society and decision-making. Women's Affairs Technical Committee 
was pioneer in raising the issue of the need of women participation in leadership through establishing a campaign entitled we participated in the struggle and we want to participate in decision making. That campaign ended with the decision of a quota system that gives women 20% of the seats in the Legislative Council. Now women organizations are calling, calling for 30% at least of the seats in all levels of decision making. Women are encouraged to run for municipal elections and three of them became mayors. A developing community leaders who are able to make difference in their communities, which requires to be connected with the surrounding communicate and communicate with people uh, to identify the problems faced by society and contributing to its solution. Palestinian Women's Center for Research and Documentation uh, in cooperation with the universities, develop action research and policy papers to be used with legislators and decision makers to develop policies and plans for bridging the gender gap. Action researches were discussed with women organizations and community leaders to be aware about equal opportunities in all actions and programs that they are implementing. Nine, education as a catalyst for social changes and the upbringing of good citizens who can play an active role in his hair society. Women organization cooperation with youth organization were aware about the rapid social changes in values, tendencies, trends, customs, and traditions. In cooperation with media organizations, these changes were discussed in order to raise the awareness of people of these changes and to be adapted to, and to be able to distinguish between what is beneficial and what is harmful for them. Uh, 10, lessons learned from COVID-19 epidemic. Certainly education in non-traditional way will be the style of future education. COVID-19 epid uh, uh, epidemic may have been important in putting us in the face of future challenges. Two years ago, students did not learn through face-to-face -face education at school or universities. Teachers were trained in non-face-to-face -face education and without the need of, for the classroom all the time. School teachers and university teachers help their students access online information, track their difficulties. Of course, there was differences between one teacher to the other, adapting themselves to their changes, but still, they are learning. Some of them find some time to enroll to the second degree or third degree of education. Others were able to read about distance education and some were enrolled in one course or more online, online education. Women organizations were trying their best to reach out women in different areas and to use technology in training and discussing issues with their clients. Integration of face-to-face -face education with online education has provided an opportunity to use modern information technology to access information and follow up students that was useful for making the balance between work and education as well. Women were able to balance family duties with education and work. Last thing here, I have to thank the uh, uh, all organizations that uh, financially uh, support us and they were mobilizing of financial resources to support uh, these programs. A lot of thanks for all these financial uh, organizations on the governmental and non-governmental level who supported these programs of which some of them cannot continue with that support. Thank you for having the time to listen to this experience and I, Yani, uh, really uh, willing to hear uh, from you uh, also uh, about uh, your comments about it. Thank you. Thank you, Rad. Thank you. I don't know how you managed to cover so much, nine points, each one so important in the short time and having met many of the, the women in these different programs with you on my trips to Palestine and knowing all that experience the transformative trajectory, a bit like 
the women that Sujata works with, uh, it's very inspiring indeed. So now we shift continents again, we move to Thais Coral in Brazil and address that big challenge of climate change and the environment. We go right over to you, Thais, you have the floor. Okay, thank you, Rama, and um, it's a pleasure to be here with uh, with uh, with longtime friends. And uh, as I was kind of preparing and trying to connect to what would be yeah. like relevant to, to share in such a short short uh, space we have in this panel, one thing that came to me was that uh, very, uh, a month ago we celebrate the hundred anniversary. Of, 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 of life, of Paulo Freire, you know, this Brazilian, this Brazilian educator that was very revolutionary for the idea of education in the world. And I always thought, you know, because I had many, many, many like uh, feminists and women's organizations over the years that worked on education and they always aligned very, very deeply with Paulo Freire, and uh, and it's interesting that I, I was reading, I mean, like uh, his main ideas and concepts, there is such an alignment, and I would like uh, to bring here just these three specific perspectives that uh, underline all his work and the work that he spread throughout so many organizations throughout the world, and I think it so much has to do with the, with the, what women has brought as the realm of education. No? First, uh, first point, which I think it was the most revolutionary, no, is that every human being has a knowledge. No, I mean, formal or informal, and this knowledge has to be honored as part of the education process. No, we, we remember that he did this literacy. I mean, the most revolutionary thing that uh, Paulo Freire did was to bring literacy to the realm of the daily life of other people. So if you lived in the favela, you are you're going to learn to, to, to read or to with the elements that were part of your culture, no? because education is so much about references. No? So if you are taken out of the reference, it seems that you don't know anything, you know? which I think it's so many times is what we were like, uh, 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 induced to, to, to believe. No, the second thing is that uh, is that uh, education is not just intellectual. There is uh, there is education is an integ integral part of our our beings. You know, not only of the world but also our beings. So it's important to to consider all levels of education, not just intellectual but also the emotional, the mental, the body, the health. All that we are, all that we are is intelligence. And I think that as we, we create this connection between the inner and outer, that education is not just technical, but it's also, I mean, we have knowledge, we, we have knowing, we have intuition, all these things that are becoming more and more as you go into all these complexities are known, I think are taken into consideration. But I think women always had, uh, because we live in this very, I would say integrated world, we kind of uh, know that, you know, and, uh, and uh, intuitively we know, but some, somehow some, uh, some of our knowing was completely discarded. And I think uh, that, uh, that, uh, that uh, already Paulo Freire talked about that, no? And the third point that I think it's so important is the communal, communal learning, no? That, uh, that we only learn uh, everyone, nobody teaches. We, 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 we are students and teachers all the time, you no? Know? Like everybody uh, 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 learns with everybody, you know? So I think that more and more, this, this, this is how we, we, all that we know, the modern technologies of learning and uh, education, they all emphasize group learning and how like uh, different uh, uh, abilities have to learn together. But this was already part of this, this platform, these three principles of and concepts of Paulo Freire. And also, because we have very little time, I would like to give you an example. No, like uh, 10 years, 15 years ago, I came to a place because that was my, um, my point. How could we create a, a way of learning, of deeply learning with each other and honoring? all kinds of knowledge and how we could evolve together by creating change, you know, that transition also from ego-centered to eco-centered and from a, 
from really honoring what we all are converging for. And this place is a, is, is a place in near Rio that Rama and, and, uh, and Zahira know about, which is called Sinaldo Valley. So I thought uh, I would share with you this two minute video that we could just have a sip of what it is, you know? Eu sou Thaís Corral e há mais de uma década atrás cheguei neste vale. O que me encantou aqui tenho certeza que vai encantar você também. Estamos pertinho de uma zona urbana cheia de casas, ruas, edifícios, cheia de cimento. Estamos perto da cidade do Rio de Janeiro, bem no fundo da Baía de Guanabara. E ainda assim, aqui entre montanhas, se esconde este vale, que é a casa, o habitat de muitas espécies de animais e de vegetação e de água. Eu comecei o Sinal do Vale porque eu queria ser a guardiã de um lugar que cuidasse dos animais, das árvores, das nascentes e das pessoas. Onde melhor fazer isso do que numa fazenda? E foi com esse chamado que aqui chegaram muitas pessoas e ajudaram a construir novos hábitos traduzidos em estações que vamos apresentar para você. Vamos apresentar a horta, os animais, a mata atlântica, a comida local, a nossa forma de consumir sem afetar a natureza e a comunidade que habita este lugar. Ah, e esquecendo de falar sobre o que significa Sinal do Vale, a sigla Sinal, sincronicidade, inovação e alegria. Três valores que cultivamos aqui. A sincronicidade que é a interdependência da vida. Abraçamos a inovação como forma de evoluir e celebramos a nossa convivência com as pessoas e a natureza com muita alegria. Agora é só conferir estação por estação e no final contar para a gente o que, que você achou. Showing pictures, no, of uh, of these things we talked about. But uh, the last thing I would like to say is that I think that the women's movement, no, over the years, the women's action agenda 21 has been like a, an example of uh, of this kind of education that integrates these different accept uh, aspects, no, that the, the the knowledge, the respect to, for everyone's knowledge. The, 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 the integral education and the communal education. So thank you very much. Thank you so much, Thais. It was very worth transporting us to the magic valley of Sinal and the exceptional work you're doing and how you brought both young people because your dream was how can we create the leaders of tomorrow to be more sustainable than our generation has been if they don't live with nature. But at the same time, you've brought so many business leaders, you know, Coca-Cola and, and um, uh, you know, BMW and so on to actually live with nature and be transformed. What I'm really struck by is the incredible resonance and how each one of you has really built upon each other. I'm also terribly proud because in my own journey of going from more conventional uh, approach to, to education and higher education, you have been such great teachers to me. I have learned so much from my experiences with you, Zahira, with the women of Palestine. I've learned so much from the core paradigm, Sujata, that you shared with us, you know, and that you're, the women I've, I've worked with in your grassroots community, the favelas of India, you know, when you find your power within and your power with each other, then you have the power to change anything in the world. And it's wonderful, uh, Thais, you, you will find out that Sujata's entire PhD, which she co-wrote with the grassroots leaders, was based on pra Paolo Freire's uh, work. And it would be great, Sujata, if you could put a couple of the links to your recent articles and interviews for us to share also with the conference organizers on this subject. So this has been, so it's wonderful that you've been such inspirations. I've actually enacted your stories and stories of the women in your three communities around the world, whether I've been educating senior leaders in the UN or working with grassroots peace builders. And, um, and that's what is the, and actually Munira's story as well. Munira was a former student of mine uh, in a course I taught for senior leaders um, of Afghanistan. And her story is also one I've enacted many times. And I'm also proud
homes for humanity, meaning you've shown how every individual and every home can be the springboard for society transformation, for ecological renewal. Uh, so with that, it's, it's really and this idea that if each one of us adopts these principles of recognizing the power within each person, and as you said, Sujata, igniting it, if each one of us is working in this collaborative, co-creative way, moving from ego to eco-centered, we really can be bringing about the change. Start with you, Pilar, and see whether we can hear one last word from the others before we just to, to thank um, Suhata, Sahira, and Thais for, for these wonderful opportunities to have an insight on what the work they have done, um, either like literacy, right, um, or helping on women on confronting violence. And Thais, I love this, echo, ecotistic instead of egotistic approaches to education, mm -hmm. eco-education. I just want to mention that one of the future approaches that exist is called SHE, it's an acronym, S-H-E, Sane, Humane, and Ecological. Just mm -hmm. look at what we saw are the three things. Mm -hmm. All the experiences that you have shared are exactly under this uh, approach of studying uh, scenarios. I am again honored to have been with you. Uh, this resonates, of course, very vastly with the uh, with um, with the specificities along the different continents. But the situation uh, for women is still um, a challenge in many aspects, especially when you are looking at at the most vulnerable um, women and also women with disabilities, and now old women, and if they are in the adult years and also with the disability is even bigger the challenge. So just to close saying that I, I, it was really wonderful to listen to all of the three of you. And we all resonated with Paulo Freire. In fact, I was going to close with Paulo Freire I, as well. So it's very interesting okay. we did mention it. Um, so yeah. I leave it here so it can yeah. go back to you. Yeah. Wonderful. Should we just hear one closing sentence of what is most resonant for each of you, um, Sujata, Zahira, and Thais, from what you heard and what you felt in this session? Sujata. I think convergence was something that I was stuck with in respect of different contexts. And as I, as Pilar just said, I mean, how Paulo Freire has directly or indirectly influenced all of us. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, Zahira, a final uh, thought, reflection, feedback from you? Okay, uh, I can say uh, by uh, uh, listening to everybody, I can pick up uh, something that uh, perhaps uh, uh, Pilar and uh, Thais had mentioned. And uh, that led to uh, uh, an, an idea to me uh, that should be discussed with women organizations, how we can be involved more in uh, global uh, issues uh, related to climate changes and uh, environment. And I think um, in Palestine, we are in need to uh, discuss that because our region is very affected to that, yani, uh, and uh, that led to the uh, really uh, very warm <coughs> weather that we have in our uh, region. Uh, little uh, rains are coming uh, in. Uh, you know, I remember when I was uh, young, it was uh, like. Uh, in September, we have a lot of rains and it continues till uh, June. And now we are in uh, December and still we didn't have uh, rain at all. And that means that water, we how we can think about a future uh, challenges related to water uh, and needs uh, hot uh, or uh, warm uh, weathers and uh, 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 you know, uh, 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 these uh, issue, eradication of uh, uh, the earth and so on. So how uh, yani, these issues should be uh, also discussed 
and uh, uh, women organizations should be involved in uh, because you know some of the issues that we worked and they are uh, successful as uh, education and uh, so on uh, make them uh, learn more about uh, these issues and perhaps we can learn from other people experiences how uh, we can do that. Thank you so much, Zahira. Uh, Zahira. Thais, your last word. As a, as a thin line that, uh, that permeates all the, 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 the talks and the conversations and I saw it throughout my almost 40, 40 years of experience, uh, 40, no, 50 years of experience, 40. Working with, uh, with women is, is our, our drive, our passion for the empowerment of each other. And education is a source of empowerment, you know, and uh, in, uh, validation, empowerment of what you know, what you already can learn and how you can express that learning in the world. And I think that we all here have uh, devoted our lives to that. So that's what I, I, I take from this panel. What a powerful note to end with you know I, I this poem just jumped up to me as I was preparing this panel and I'm going to share it as a closing note women procreators of the possible and I dedicate it to all of you I also dedicate it to Munira who had to flee from Afghanistan um, because her life was in danger and now is for the second time in her life a refugee and in addition to being a woman leader is also a poet and an artist so I'm dedicating this to all of the women like you who are pioneering change. Your eyes spy vistas of possibilities unfathomed. Your ears hear the chant of that which longs for change. Your nostrils spell, smell opportunities even in the midst of crisis. Your touch is the blessing that renews and regenerates your fingers spin designs of a future worth living. You are pioneers who awaken the human spirit. You are procreators of the world we've all long awaited. <laughs>